I'm a co-director of a research centre called CRISP. We have a banner up here, we have a logo here. One of my other co-directors, Professor Charles Rabb, is going to speak immediately after me. We're interested as a research centre um, of the consequences and impacts and meanings of living in a surveillance society, issues to do with information processing, privacy and surveillance. Okay, you can find out much more information about us on the website, of course, um, and we're relatively easy to find. Okay, so what am I going to talk about this morning? Um, I've been asked to talk about surveillance and your lives in a surveillance society. Um, I'm also setting up the two presenters that are going to speak after me. So I'm going to say something also about privacy and I'm going to say something also about security to show how the world of surveillance permeates all sorts of different topic areas, including the, the, the things we're talking about this morning. Okay, so the surveillance society. Okay, I think that's clear. Okay, so when we talk about surveillance, people instinctively think about modern technologies, new technologies. But I think we can have a starting point, which is about surveillance as a normal human instinct. And I think this is one of the reasons why we're so accepting of surveillance, is that we understand as a basic human need to undertake surveillance in different environments. So for example, think about the mother and a newborn child, the mother watching over the child, looking after the child. Think also about the way that some elements of, of religion works, about the, the, about the all-seeing God and about the community of looking over the local community. Think about local social groupings, the way that they look after each other. Think about also the way that castles are constructed on hills to oversee the environment, to look out and protect those communities. So surveillance is something that's always happened. It isn't necessarily linked to new technology. It's also about, about power and control. So the mother has the control over the child. She's looking after it. She exercises the power. And the same goes in those other examples that I use in religious settings, in, um, in the medieval castle setting. There's an element of power and control. So somebody is doing the surveillance and somebody is being surveilled. Okay, so the background then is it's not just about new technology. But what we have with new technology is we have developments in ICTs, information and communication technologies, that have expanded the potential to undertake surveillance in new and maybe unforeseen ways. So we see lots of technologies that are part of our everyday life. So it's very difficult to live in modern society without using new technology. So think about, for example, CCTV, our use of the internet, bank cards, credit cards, store cards. Um, we might have um, smart TVs, we might have um, lots of different technologies that you interact with on a regular basis. Your mobile phones are probably uh, being used a lot today already. Okay, so these technologies, they gather information about us, they process information about us, and they share that information about us. And this happens on a massive scale. Okay, so these technologies may or may not, in your mind, be surveillance technologies, but the point is that they have surveillance potential. Some surveillance technologies, like CCTV, they're very explicit surveillance technologies. We know they are there for <coughs> safety, security, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But other technologies have a latent surveillance potential. So your mobile phone may be a communications device, but it's also a tracking device. It could be used to track you. It could be used retrospectively to see where you have been, to, to also as a, a device for uh, identifying you. Okay, so other technologies that do process information have surveillance capability. So what we use typically in academia is this term technologically mediated surveillance practices. So this is to differentiate between ordinary surveillance that we might do in a natural way as a human being and surveillance that's mediated by technology. So when we talk about the surveillance society, what we're talking about is the degree to which these sorts of technologies have permeated everything we do. And these information flows shape our activities and they shape our life chances. And this is why surveillance is very important. So your use of your mobile phone, your use of the internet actually shapes your future because you're profiled as a result of using those technologies. You are tracked. That might determine what services and what products are made available to you. So that in turn is shaping your use of those services in the future. Um, so, I can give you some examples, but I will move on and we can maybe come back to some examples in, in the discussion later. 
Okay, the point being then is that I'm trying to make is that living in a surveillance society, living in a society where we rely on these sorts of technologies, these everyday technologies, they're not special survey, they're not special security technologies, they're everyday technologies. These do shape our, char our life chances and our futures. Okay, so how does this affect what we do on a day-to-day -day basis? We generate vast quantities of information as we use the internet, as we use our mobile phones, as we drive our cars, as we use government services. The data that we generate has value, and it can be used by others to provide us services, so it can be used by marketing agencies to target specific services at us, it can be used by public agencies to profile us, to think about um, you know, the likelihood of us being a terrorist, for example. And the digital footprint, as we often refer to it, are those little digital trails that we leave as we go about our business. And we use the digital footprint on the Chris Banner to kind of indicate um, the link between the information society and the surveillance society. And what, what I would say about the surveillance society is that it's big business, okay? So there's lots of companies and uh, lots of organizations that are busy engaged in activities which support them in our economy, but also support the emergence of a surveillance society. So think about, for example, companies that do online marketing. Think, for example, companies that use the internet that sometimes seem to be free, like Facebook or Twitter. Um, or Google, these companies all use our information to provide the service. We don't pay for them directly, but our data is what is given value, and they sell that data on um, for advertising and for other reasons. Also, surveillance is about having an, an infrastructure, the telecoms infrastructure, the cable, the satellites, e-government facilities, the security industry, which increasingly is using all these sorts of technologies to, uh, to, for public safety and to tackle issues like terrorism. So surveillance is big business. It's not just integrated into what we do, it's integrated into our, our economy and integrated into our uh, institutional life in the UK. So what we could say about the modern surveillance society is it's all around us. It's ubiquitous, it's subtle, it's normal, it's mundane. Um, we're not talking about secret services and spies, we're just talking about everyday, ordinary behaviour that happens all around us. We shouldn't be surprised when we find out that um, our information is used to profile us, because this is happening all the time. We shouldn't be surprised when they capture terrorists because of they've been profiling use, their use of the internet and they've been profiling their friendship networks, for example. So surveillance is embedded into the fabric of everyday life. Partly hidden, partly subtle, sometimes difficult for us to see, but we shouldn't be surprised that these sorts of things take place. Academics also talk about something called surveillance creep. Okay, now the idea behind surveillance creep is very simple, and this happens also with all sorts of technologies. That you introduce a technology for one purpose, over time it migrates into other purposes. And I think this is what makes surveillance technologies sometimes contested, because people might introduce a technology like CCTV, to combat crime and disorder, but then it's used for issuing parking tickets. So these sorts of creep, these sorts of creeps that we find all sorts of technologies, sometimes they upset people, sometimes they are contested. So for example, um, those of you who have bought a new car recently, certainly not us academics, I suspect, um, will now realize that you don't have to have a tax disc. You don't have to display a tax disc on a car anymore because there is a national network of ANPR cameras that check whether or not your car doesn't just have road tax but is valid to drive, that is owned by somebody legitimate in the UK and that it has an MOT and has insurance and all these sorts of things. Okay, so um, that particular technology, ANPR, has crept into all these different, um, to check these different aspects of, uh, of car usage. Okay, so surveillance could be contested. It is often contested, or it may be resisted even, because it involves power relations. It's about an agency, be it a commercial company or the state, surveying people and influencing their behaviour. That's why surveillance is often contested, sometimes resisted, um, and there are many examples of that. So people try to, uh, for example, rebel against the use of Facebook, rebel against the use of CCTV. So there's no coincidence that the rise of the hoodie had coincides with the rise of the CCTV camera revolution. Okay, so people do feel sometimes that, they, that, the, that surveillance involves an intrusion, an intrusion into, their, um, into their personal lives, an intrusion into their own personal privacy. So surveillance, control, 
maybe resistance. In the UK, it's often said that we resist surveillance far less than other European countries, which may be a point of discussion later on. Because surveillance control is controlling, because surveillance shapes our lives, it therefore requires very careful governance. We need to think very carefully about the rules in which people can use, the, the, the ways in which people do use our information, what purposes are valid, what purposes aren't valid, how much information can be collected, how can it be exchanged, how do we set those parameters. This is my, my final slide. Um, Okay, so what I wanted to do on this final slide is I just wanted to talk about the way the surveillance society links into privacy and security, which are the two following speakers are going to talk about. And the point I would make here is that the three, surveillance, privacy and security, are increasingly intertwined. They're closely joined together in modern society. So in terms of privacy, I've already alluded to this huge mountains of data that we all create, and which are used, they have value. They're used by public agencies, they're used by marketing firms. So what sort of rights do we have as individuals in a modern society about the use of this information? Can we as individuals determine what information is collected? Can we determine how it's used? Can we determine when we want it to stop being collected? Do we have any ownership over the information at all? Is all the information created and owned by the state or by private agencies? So these are all very pertinent questions for privacy in a surveillance society. In terms of security, I think increasingly we will all be aware that we have this explosion of surveillance-oriented security systems and practices. So these sorts of things I've been talking about, mobile phones, the internet, ANPR, CCTV, are all used for um, public security, national security, tracking terrorists. So tracking, profiling, identifying, and often we see news items about how these sorts of technologies are used in this way. Now the issue then becomes, should this sort of surveillance take place for security purposes at the mass level, <coughs> i.e. the sorts of systems that Edward Snowden has alerted us to, or in a more targeted way? Should the profiling then target the people who are most likely to be terrorists, most likely to be robbers or car, car thieves? Okay, so the final point I'd make about the link between surveillance and security is that they're both very highly emotive subject areas. And interestingly, it's that they're like flipping the side of a coin. So you have security. Everybody wants more security. Everybody wants to be safe. Security is good for us, good for society. But people feel a bit ambivalent towards surveillance, maybe even more strongly than ambivalent. Maybe people feel that surveillance is bad. They're a little bit scared of surveillance. They feel maybe that surveillance is slightly threatening to them at an individual level. So whilst the two are so closely inter interlocked, we have different feelings about them, different feelings about the purposes of surveillance and security. Okay, so I'm going to finish now. I've had my two-minute warning. Um, so hopefully I've given you an overview of the surveillance society. Hopefully I've given you a, a few ideas about how it links into privacy and security. And my concluding comment would be, given what I've just said in the last 15 minutes about our existence in a surveillance society, how on earth do we decide what levels of surveillance are appropriate and how do we govern those levels of surveillance when we've decided what is appropriate? So that would be my parting comment. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so, lots of information there, uh, uh, an overview of perspective, which we now uh, have some further data from Professor Chan Ram. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, there we go. Uh, I'm Charles Rabb, I'm a professor of government at the University of Edinburgh, and of course, surveillance will be used this afternoon at Murrayfield, uh, in case it was not happen to be going. May, may the better team win, and it probably will. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, what I want to talk about is nicely led into by William, uh, my fellow co director at CRISP, um, relates to not, not just you know, how do we decide about um, how much surveillance and, and what are the rights and wrongs of it and so on. There's also a question of who decides that and how this uh, goes to, how that goes through various um, processes of decision making. Now one of the things I wanted to jump off from, um, which set me thinking, was the call uh, about uh, late 2013 <clears throat> by the Intelligence and Security Committee in the wake of the Snowden revelations about the collection of mass communications by um, uh, security agencies in this country and in the USA. And the, the committee, uh, which is a committee of parliament, decided that they would have a, 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 an 
investigation into the relationship between privacy and security. Um, I don't want to talk about their findings and their report, which was just published last week, but this was the call for evidence. And it said, um, as you can read, in addition to considering whether the current statutory framework governing access to private communications remains adequate, the committee is also considering the appropriate balance between our individual right to privacy and the collective right to security. And when I saw that, I thought there are problems. I think fundamentally that the formulation is mistaken. Um, it's rhetorical and it's imprecise because look, look at what it does. It pits the individual right to privacy against the collective right to security. Uh, which is very rhetorical. It has a kind of ring. It's almost, you know, why should the individual with his or her privacy interests stand against the collective right, brackets, good of uh, security, national security, preventing us from uh, threats of terrorism or uh, criminality and so forth. And I think that that formulation impedes a deeper understanding of what's at stake. Um, there are three difficulties which I want to outline in the talk. One has to do with what we mean by privacy. See, the second is what we mean by security. And the third is what we mean when we say national security versus personal privacy. And I think a better question that the committee could have asked is something like, in combating terror and other threats through surveillance, how can we ensure that through a more nuanced understanding, the claims for security measures don't always prevail when other values and rights are also at stake? Um, let me move on from that and consider privacy. Um, well, as I'm sure you know, privacy is a, is a right, it's enshrined in, in rights legislation and declarations of human rights. Uh, it's a fundamental right, but it's not an absolute right. It can be overridden for various reasons which then have to be demonstrated to be valid reasons. Um, but it is an individual right, and the individual right assumption ignores the wider importance of privacy and what privacy means to us, why we want privacy and why we need uh, privacy. It seems to me that privacy is a crucial underpinning of interpersonal relationships. That sounds paradoxical. We think of privacy as a, a retreat from connections, but in fact, it's a facilitator of personal relationships. If we know that those relationships can be kept private within a sort of membrane that embraces the people who are related to each other. It's an important principle in society itself and in the workings of the democratic <coughs> political system. Think, for example, of um, how you vote. This used to be, in fact, where one came to vote in this, uh, in this constituency. And there's the, as you know, the, the, the booth. You go in and nobody can see what, you, what box you tick. And the secrecy of the ballot is an important principle of, uh, of, of democratic politics. The ability to get together with other people in groups and talk about politics, and maybe uh, even to form political parties or pressure groups without being surveilled, is a very important principle sustaining democracy. So privacy isn't just important for the individual who wants to feel it's me, myself, as an autonomous person, but in order to make those kinds of political and social connections. And therefore, when privacy is protected, um, the full fabric of society and political processes and the exercise of important freedoms, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, are also protected through the protection of privacy. And therefore, the corollary of that is that when it's eroded, when privacy is eroded, not just the individual might be harmed, but society and the political system as well. Therefore, I would contend that privacy is important in the public interest, not just in my interest or each of you in your individual interest, but there is a public interest in making sure that privacy can be protected in a society and a political system in which, we, in which we live. Moving on from that to consider security. Now, security is also, oh, sorry, a uh, different. I forgot my, my next slide. Uh, also, when we talk about privacy, we may mean very different kinds of things. There's privacy of the person, physical body, privacy of our thoughts and feelings, behavior, action, location, and space. William's talking about tracking people through surveillance techniques in, in, in real time, real space. 
privacy of our personal communications, which is very much at stake in the whole post Snowden uh, episode. Privacy of our personal data and our images, and also privacy of associations. Now then we move on to talk about security, which is also a right. It's enshrined in rights legislation, enshrined in international declarations. And there are many ways, however, of understanding security. Um, and it's cognitive, uh, which one might say is public safety. The word safety and security kind of go together. We sometimes don't differentiate uh, between the recent speech by uh, the, uh, the um, Secretary of State for Defense uh, just last week. Uh, he was talking about security, national security, and I checked how many times he used the word safety, keeping us safe, the intelligence agencies and uh, whoever else keeping us safe. There's a kind of blurring of what we mean by safety and security, but it's never really clearly defined. There's personal security, of course. William talked about people living, living in castles, and I would phrase it you know, that a man, a person's home is his castle. It means not only that they are defended and they feel secure, but they also feel private and secure. They're also able to defend their, the privacy of what they have in that castle, what they do in that castle, from the prying eyes of, of others outside. Then there's collective uh, security, collective safety, whether it's international, or national, or local, neighborhood, social group uh, level. People feel, feel secure in their neighborhoods, secure in their streets. Um, then another aspect of security is that it's not clear whether we're talking about something objective, as it were, which it has to do with the probabilities of risk of something uh, undermining your security, or is it a subjective feeling, the feeling of being insecure? which may not have anything to do with the so-called objective determination of the probabilities of risk. It's a very complex relationship between the subjective and the objective uh, uh, senses of security. And uh, it's not a question of which is better, which is true, and so on. If people feel insecure, then that's a real fact which the political system has to take account of, even if objectively they are not at risk. Um, young men between the, 18, 20, the ages of 18 and 25 are far more at risk of physical harm than elderly people walking along the night. Um, how do we reconcile these different views? Well, again, as with privacy, which had those different sorts of things, privacy with phones and associations and all the rest, security likewise has many different kinds. And in the uh, security and privacy debate, as exemplified by um, the ISC's call for evidence, there's a rather, rather narrow definition related to terrorism, organized crime, and maybe things to do with border security. But for the general public, security means a whole range of different sorts of things, much more related to physical security, political security, socioeconomic security, is my job safe, and so on, cultural security, cultural identity, big issue there. In the UK, environmental security, climate change, um, radical uncertainty security, that is it's a terrible phrase, but it refers to uh, the uh, real deep seated feeling that we don't know what's going to be next with regard to anything that might affect our lives. And also information security, which of course has to do with mass communications and uh, other forms of uh, the flow of personal data, for example. Now, privacy and civil liberties or freedoms are valuable because um, of the security and safety, and not least the safety and security of personal data that are provided to individuals, to groups, and to uh, societies. Um, privacy is closely related to those liberties and uh, uh, freedoms, and security is mixed up in there as well. William said that surveillance, security, and pr privacy are increasingly discussed in the same in the same framework of discussion and of discourse. Well, where can we go to look at that a little bit more? Even across the Atlantic, in the wake of the Obama of the Snowden revelations, President Obama uh, set up a, um, a committee to produce a report on liberty and security in a changing world. 
And this is, this is what they say. I don't want to read the whole thing, but um, you can read it there. If anybody wants more slides, I can send it to you. And they, uh, that report said, in the US, uh, the United States government must protect at once two different forms of security, national security and personal privacy. In terms of what I've just been, in terms of what I've just been saying, um, they look at privacy and national security as two different forms of security. So they're not opposed to each other, security or privacy versus privacy. They're two forms of security. Um, and that is, I think, a very important insight. Now we come to look very finally at the whole question of what about national security versus personal privacy question. Um, as I've been suggesting, the relationship is far more complex than that formulation, partly because the concepts of privacy and of security are themselves much more really complex. And therefore, one should be skeptical about the idea of making a balance and a trade-off, which is the usual mantra that is given about how we reconcile that A versus B thing. If you're doing a balancing act, well, what kind of thing is that? Is that between one right and another, between privacy and, uh, and security, uh, between one individual right and, and a collective right, um, between an individual right and a social or collective utility. In other words, um, something which is not, which is important for society, but not yet a right that people feel they have and can point to in a document as being a collective right, but it's a utility, it's something that's important uh, to, to have. <coughs> is balancing the method or is it the outcome of the method? That's also left ambiguous. Um, and then there are finally, very new to um, some questions to, to ask as to look at it. Um, the question about how much we should give up of one thing to have the other is very rarely asked in terms of how much security should we give up to protect privacy. It's always the other way around. We have to give up some privacy to protect ourselves in terms of national security. Uh, what would happen if we reversed the, 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 pool, the, the, the polarities of that, that question? Um, also, how do you do a balancing when there isn't a common metric or a common understanding of what we mean by an equilibrium? Um, and then there's the question of distribution. Whose privacy should, be, uh, should come second to whose security? And how can we justify that? Are there inequalities, inequities that, uh, in terms of social policy, we would find uh, reprehensible? Um, I won't go further uh, on that slide, but I just want to come at the very end of my final slide. There is a project called PRISMS, not PRISM, which is a, uh, a, um, a way of performing mass communication surveillance, but PRISMS, which is an academic study that I'm a part of, which has been doing uh, surveys of, of citizens' attitudes towards privacy and security. And just in a nutshell, um, the findings are that if you look across Europe at uh, people in 27 member states in the EU, uh, there are 28, but we didn't do Croatia. Um, both, privacy and both privacy and security are important to people. They don't perceive it as a trade off. It relates, it depends upon a context in which different kinds of privacy and different kinds of security are being implicated. So, what people might feel about the propriety of surveillance. In, in, in a football stadium is different from what they might perceive about propriety of surveillance in um, their, neighbor, their neighborhood streets. People have a nuanced attitude towards this, and it can't be summed up as a, a kind of omnibus idea of privacy versus security, which do you prefer? Those are the, the final <coughs> things I need to say, and I hope that these are some thought-provoking um, questions and critical comments that Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, um, for uh, introducing the paper before this session. And now we have uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Neal uh, on his topic security, accountability, and shared governance in Scotland and the UK. We have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. 
Well, I've been leading a, a research council funded seminar series looking at Scotland's security and constitutional change since uh, about 18 months ago. These were closed door events held at the University of Edinburgh under the Chatham House rule. And what we did was bring together a variety of academics, uh, politics, international relations, law, criminology, and so on, and a number of practitioners who are involved in security governance. These included, at different times, counter-terrorism police, Scottish government officials, Scotland office officials, and former members of the intelligence community, often retired members who are more free to, free to speak. We began our event before the white paper was published, so there was a lot of unknown in the debate, and we had to respond to developments as they happened during the independence campaign. Now, I think that the, the seminars were successful in their aims insofar as we did contribute to the, the national debate about Scottish independence. We had some media coverage and made a few uh, choice interventions about security matters. However, we did find it difficult to get measured analysis into the press. Security is one of those topics where it's almost too easy to generate headlines, and all too often they are alarmist headlines, even if that's not the, not the intention. So what we never argued was that an independent Scotland would have poor national security. But what we did argue was that there were many unanswered and in many ways unresolvable questions given the highly politicised uh, context of the referendum campaign. Issues included security service continuity after independence. It was fairly clear to us and many other commentators actually that there would have been the question of a gap in security service, intelligence service cover between the official independence day of an independent Scotland and a fully operational independent Scottish intelligence service. Some estimates put five or ten years on how long it would take to have a fully operational service up and running. Same with high level cyber security cover. You can't just buy that sort of thing off the shelf. You can't replicate GCHQ overnight, for example. And same with the loss of foreign intelligence, the foreign intelligence that comes, that comes from MI6 and from the Five Eyes intelligence sharing arrangement, which provide, amongst other things, upstream warning, upstream early warning of threats. Now, given the politics of the, of the debate, we had to make a few assumptions. We assumed that Scotland's future friends and neighbours, and independent Scotland's future friends and neighbours, would have an interest in Scotland being secure and safe. So we didn't think that Scotland would be completely left out in the cold. But we thought the issue was more a matter of, of national competition, national advantage. We have to remember that intelligence agencies are not only used for defensive purposes, or that's normally how they're, how they're justified when they're discussed. The intelligence agencies serve a purpose of providing security and defending economic well-being. Now that's a, a, a rather large and amorphous concept. <coughs> The point is that intelligence is also used for commercial advantage. And actually the Treasury is one of the main uh, ministerial customers of intelligence within, within Whitehall. Looking at this slightly differently, both the UK and Finland, and possibly other countries as well, have made it a national priority to turn their own country into, one, into the safest places to do business in the world online. So cyber security is being uh, sold as a way to attract international inward investment. And we came to the conclusion that an independent Scotland simply could not compete on this basis. So not that it would be insecure, but that it wouldn't be able to sell itself in the way that Finland and the UK can sell themselves as secure places to, to do business. And they wouldn't have the commercial advantage that MI6 and GCHQ can give to the Treasury for. I've even met a, a senior cybersecurity professional in the private sector, a self-declared lifelong Scottish nationalist who claimed he voted no on this very issue, on the issue of cybersecurity, despite all his lifelong dreams and so on. Now, of course, much of this is moot uh, for now. Perhaps we'll have a rerun in a few years' time. Now, our seminars are still running, and we've had to put them on hold. It's been very unclear what status security has in the, in the post referendum politics and in the Smith Commission process. So from September we had to wait all the way through to the, to the new year until we could see Smith, the outcome of the Smith Commission and the new Scotland Bill. Now there, there is only one substantial mention of security in the, in the Scotland Bill and in the Smith Commission report. 
And this relates to devolution of the Crown estate. And this is, this is a relatively minor issue, but it does somehow get to the heart of the matter. So the Crown estate is, is going to be devolved to Scotland. The Scottish part of the Crown estate is going to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. And that includes the Crown estate's seabed, urban assets, rural estates, mineral and fishing rights. It's the mineral rights, i.e. oil, gas, which are the most important. So both documents talk about how devolution must not be detrimental to UK-wide critical national infrastructure in relation to matters such as defence and security, oil and gas and energy, thereby safeguarding the defence and security importance of the Crown Estate's foreshore and seabed assets to the UK as a whole. Now what does that mean? Well, it reaffirms the main principle, which is that security remains a reserved matter for Westminster. And there's no real question of that changing. However, constitutional change does present some lingering ambiguities, which may become more apparent as we, as we move ahead. So I'm going to talk about my own submission to the Smith Commission process, which tried to highlight some of these ambiguities through eight points. So first point, the traditional policy areas relating to security are defence and, and foreign relations. And those are, have long been understood as the core security functions of sovereign states. However, we can no longer assume that security is confined to defence and foreign affairs uh, policy areas. The boundaries of security are becoming blurred. Point number two, as I've just said, security is no longer confined to military intelligence and foreign affairs matters. And we can see this in the UK national security strategy. The National Security Strategy, in effect, considers that almost any area of social, political and economic life could give rise to security threats. For example, not just traditional uh, security concerns like war and terrorism, but flooding, regional level flooding, trade disruption, climate change. All of these could flare up to become national security threats. Cybersecurity, for example, has never made a tier one threat under the current, under the current government. Now, the NSS, the National Security Strategy, serves the purpose of setting security priorities. And in that sense, it's an, it's an interesting development in British security governments. It's only existed for uh, seven or eight years or so on. And it's true that government action on national security doesn't always match up to the policy wording. So, for example, the National Security Council tends to be preoccupied with, with traditional foreign affairs security matters rather than these other issues like flooding, trade disruption, and so on. But of course, that could, that could change. But given this new conceptualization of security as broad and potentially arising from any, any part of social, political, and economic life, it follows that security could become an issue in almost any policy area. And that could involve any ministry or any parliamentary committee finding themselves with a stake with an interest in security matters. So, for example, Ebola as a health and security threat doesn't simply involve ministries of defence and foreign affairs, but health ministries as well. Energy security. The Energy Committee at uh, Westminster has published several reports about energy, energy security. Trade disruption, cyber security, bringing business and skills, for example. So we have a broadening out of security from a core of ministries and government to potentially any ministry and part of government. In the official language, security has become a whole of government problem. And this means that ministries like business and skills, even <coughs> culture, media and sport, have a designated role in the national security strategy and in the related cyber security strategy. Point number four. A few security threats would only affect particular constituent nations of the UK. So it's unlikely there would be threats which are only of concern to England or only of concern to Scotland. You could have regional level issues like uh, flooding, for example, is unlikely to affect the whole UK at the same time. But we have to assume that threats are not, or not usually geographically confined. They are a concern for the whole of the UK. Further devolution to Scotland could complicate the possibility of coordinated action in response to um, various non-traditional security threats, and indeed traditional security threats as well. At the moment, uh, there are mechanisms for coordination. We have COBRA in London, the, the Resilience and Emergency Management Committee, 
and an equivalent body in Edinburgh, which is called SCORE, the Scottish Government Resilience Room. They can work together as necessary. The Scottish ministers can speak to COBRA as needed. That happened with the uh, oil, refinery oil refinery attacks in North Africa, where several Scots were working, and the Glasgow airport attacks as well. Point number six, and this is where I think it gets more interesting. Devolved regions need to have a clear role in the democratic oversight of UK-wide powers and agencies, such as intelligence services, such as the new National Crime Agency, which may eventually take the lead role in counter-terrorism efforts. And there start to be a few constitutional oddities here. The National, the National Crime Agency officially covers the whole of the UK, but it can only direct police chiefs in England and Wales. In Scotland, it can only work with the devolved police. There's already an uneven role there. If the NCA starts to play the lead role in counter-terrorism, rather than the Metropolitan Police or uh, Police Scotland, for example, there could be some kind of uneven application here. Perhaps that's a practical, practical matter rather than a constitutional matter. Let's think about the intelligence agencies. The intelligence agencies are active in Scotland, and they are active for Scotland. But accountability and oversight entirely resides at Westminster. There is no intelligence service accountability at all at Holyrood. Now, the Intelligence and Security Committee does have several Scots on it at the moment, Malcolm Rifkin, Min Campbell, Lord Lothian. We don't know what the next membership will look like. Now, note that these, these Scottish members are all former ministers or senior politicians of one kind or another. What effect will further devolution have on the role of Scottish MPs at Westminster? Are they going to be able to rise to these senior positions, being former ministers, senior politicians, and so on? Are Scottish MPs going to have an increasingly meagre role at Westminster? Is their legitimacy going to be questioned? Could you have a Scottish MP being Secretary of State for a ministry which only applies to England and Wales? Health, education, business and skills, culture, media and sport. Will Scottish MPs ever be future Prime Ministers? Scotland has been overrepresented in the history of British Prime Ministers. Will that stop? Will UK level politics become dominated by English MPs? All of this has implications for security accountability. So point number seven, any reduction in the role of Scottish MPs needs to bear in mind the emerging status of security as a whole of government problem. If security can involve any part of government, but national security is, well, national security and um, ministries which are only related to England and Wales are dominated by English ministers and MPs, what effect will that have on Scottish representation on national security issues? And then finally, point number eight. And this actually is what troubled me most of all in the whole process. At present, the Scottish Parliament has demonstrated little interest, possibly even no interest, in security matters. Scottish democratic accountability of security, defence, foreign affairs, and security as a whole of government problem relies on Scottish MPs at Westminster, whose role is going to be, I think, uh, increasingly uh, shrunk and challenged in terms of legitimacy. So this is what's troubled me most of all, this lack of interest or engagement. And there are a lot of reasons to explain why there is a lack of interest. MSPs, rightly speaking, had other things on their mind in the run-up to the referendum. And I think we do need to be careful of, of talking up the threat. I certainly wouldn't like a situation where security becomes politicised at Holyrood. And I certainly don't think the MSPs should become more fearful of security threats in their, in their public discourse. But if security is now going to be a whole of government problem, but dominated by Westminster and English MPs, then MSCs, I think, do need to better consider their stake in national and devolved accountability structures. Thank you very much. So, uh, in the constitutional context, this discussion where severe is. Uh, security and, and uh, what we do then. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's over to you. We have 15 minutes for questions. There are, um, there is a roving microphone, um, and uh, if you would like to uh, address your remarks, um, you might want to introduce yourselves, um, but uh, there's no compulsion. Um, uh, and uh, I see one hand up over there.
Yes, I'm Clive Mitchell. Uh, thank you for the three fascinating and insightful presentations. Um, two observations that kind of combine into a question for me. Um, one is around what we're looking at in relation to surveillance and what we're not looking at. Um, so, a lot of emphasis on personal and social security and various forms of crime and so on. Um, but that made me think about some of the crimes that we might not be looking at through current surveillance techniques like tax avoidance, which might be regarded, for example, as a larger social nuisance depending on the sums of money that are involved. And how does that kind of play into some of the discussions? And I guess relating to that, a strong theme across the presentation seems to be one about rights of various kinds, individual social groupings and what have you. The flip side of that, I think, is something around duties and responsibilities. I guess I wonder what a, what a discussion around surveillance would look like uh, through a lens of duties and responsibilities as opposed to rights-based discussion. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, okay, so you mentioned that um, the emphasis was on uh, certain types of technologies and um, security and privacy, and you gave an example there of, of tax avoidance. Um, these sorts of surveillance systems that I was talking about are extensively used for looking at the banking and finance industries, um, looking at how money transfers around the globe. Um, there are vested interests in some parts of the world to make sure those sorts of processes aren't too vigorous. Um, but certainly um, in the UK, there, there is a, a, a sizable number of people who do look at um, the movement of money using um, surveillance systems um, on the internet and also other sorts of systems. It's not my area of expertise, but I have I have come across various articles and various bits of research that do look at that. You mentioned rights and um, the rights of individuals, the rights of citizens in society, and um, you're correct. Often discussions around surveillance and security come back to issues of rights um, and the other side of the coin, and we often teach our students, is that when you talk about rights, you also talk about duties and responsibilities. Interestingly, I have seen uh, a very prominent technologist recently say that um, our duties and responsibilities in a surveillance society are to participate, are to give out our data, to allow these companies like Facebook to flourish, allow, um, allow uh, Google to, to help us in the surveillance society. Um, and I wonder whether or not um, our responsibility um, is to know more ourselves about how these sorts of things work. Our responsibility is maybe more to know, for example, what information are we giving out regularly? Because if we know more about the sorts of things that go on, it's much easier for us to make judgments about whether we feel happy about that or whether or not we feel that those sorts of practices are good or bad. At the moment, we know too little, so it's very difficult to make those judgments, in my view. Um, thank you for the, the question. I want to come on <clears throat> take up the first one about things like tax avoidance. Uh, one of the areas of research that I'm involved in has to do with um, how information processes and information flows can be regulated and how they are uh, regulated. And in the area of financial transfers, there's been a great deal of consternation in recent years over um, how um, large-scale transfers between banks, uh, how information and monitoring and surveillance of that can be, can be best effective. And uh, there's a thing called SWIFT, which is Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Transfer, something like that, based in Brussels. Uh, and they oversee these kinds of things. But when you look at the, at the jurisdictional issues concerned with flow of information and deep flow of money across national jurisdictions where you have different <coughs> and different systems for um, safeguarding that kind of information. A huge issue has arisen between the EU and the USA about <coughs> transfers of swift information um, between um, European banks and the USA. That's not yet resolved and, and, and it, it illustrates the difficulty of arriving at global or international means of regulation for surveillance information, which is what we call monitoring financial transfers. Uh, and that's not an easy job. And 
if you take it outside the question of financial transfers into other kinds of transfers of information, again, there you have different jurisdictions, different levels, different suspicions about the data that might be secure in Europe going to another jurisdiction where it wouldn't be secure, where privacy and then you would that, that would be. Those are abiding problems which are uh, going to be with us for a long time as more and more things are digitized and information is flowing increasingly across boundaries into countries and jurisdictions where the levels of protection Yes, I just wanted to add something on the, on the question of, of tax avoidance. Uh, one of the things I've discovered recently by speaking to people in the, in the financial security sector is that there's very much a continuity in the kinds of tools which are used for financial security. So, for example, what began in the 80s and 90s as tools to prevent money laundering connected to uh, drugs cartels was turned into a mechanism for tracking terrorist finance in the years of the war on terror, and has now been developed into a system for tackling global tax avoidance. So the question is, um, the question is one of political priorities. I think since the financial crisis, global tax avoidance has been on the political agendas of, of many countries. And the, the weight of the financial security mechanism has, through regulation, been turned towards this. So I think there isn't such a distinction between what is and what is not looked at. It's more a question of what policy priorities do you turn your existing tools towards? And we've got time for two questions. Uh, so we have two hands up, and uh, we'll take your two questions, and then uh, we'll do the answers of that. Hey, and we'll it. Thank, thank you for the three really good presentations. Um, just to pick up one point, I'm fascinated by the concept of um, um, personal privacy having a societal benefit. It has benefits far beyond simple rights of the individual. Now, we all often hear politicians rather flippantly comment that if you're not doing anything wrong, you've nothing to hide. Can you give us a sort of a, a, a 15 second rejoinder to that flip comment? Uh, yeah, the gentleman on the right was talking about um, public opinion surrounding um, privacy. And one of the things that's been quite interesting following the Snowden leaks and the WikiLeaks stuff is there's not, there's been a surprising lack of public um, criticism of this. I mean, there's in, in places like Iceland, there's been very strong reactions, but in places like the UK and in America, there's not been a very strong political reaction against uh, this kind of idea of surveillance. So why do you think that has been? There's been no strong reaction. On that last one, um, one begins to suspect that there's value in the water supply, uh, which uh, in this country has Result in a rather laid back, non responsive uh, uh, attitude towards that, uh, towards those things. Whereas you mentioned Iceland, uh, but in the USA, for example, it's much more vocal uh, than, than, uh, than in the UK. It's very interesting, and what one is trying to explain this in the survey that I mentioned there, the surveys show that fairly consistently uh, British attitudes are much more laid back about the invasions of privacy than uh, elsewhere. That in itself doesn't mean that people want to be laid back about these things. And we shouldn't gauge our policy simply by what people say they want or don't want. If there are very important rights involved, and if we can uh, you know, show why there are dangers and harms uh, that are really quite uh, ever-present, even if people don't realize. So it is a kind of anomaly um, compared to other European countries, for example, Germany, where the reaction on invasions of privacy and so forth has been extremely dangerous in the historical and cultural and also legal constitutional reasons for that. Let me segue to um, the, the first uh, question. I can't give you 15 seconds. I can probably give you 15 hours. Um, you don't have 15 hours. I know we don't have 20 seconds. 
Um, uh, I think that it's probably an unusual position to take that privacy is something that is important for society. There is an increasing philosophical and sociological uh, argument uh, to substantiate that kind of claim. And if we can do thought experiments uh, about, you know, think of what it would be like to live in a society in which you couldn't have your privacy protected. And then move from that to thinking about some of the former countries in, uh, in the Soviet, uh, in Soviet world, where you didn't, uh, you, you couldn't be guaranteed that the privacy of your thoughts, your communications, your conversations in the public were not being overheard and so forth. And look what that does to the fabric of society. It means that you have basically a kind of society made up of people who are in constant fear of contact with others for, for, for purposes, because their lives, their jobs, whatever else might be at stake. And therefore, if you ponder on that, then you can begin to see how privacy, the importance of the protection of privacy for the fabric of society as a whole, and not just for me, 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 my privacy. Thank you, Charles. Okay, very briefly, I'd just like to address the point about having nothing, I have nothing to hide, so I have nothing to fear. Um, I've been doing research on CCTV for 20 years now, and I, can, I can't think of how many policemen have put this proposition to me. It also appears in numerous policy documents about CCTV. And uh, I think also I've had on, on live TV um, journalists ask, pose this issue to me. And what I would norm how I normally respond is um, that this, this actually poses the problem incorrectly because you could say, why then do we also have curtains in our house, houses? You know, this, we don't have curtains because we're all criminals. We don't have, well, maybe, maybe some of you are. Um, we, don't, we don't have curtains because we're up to no good. We have curtains because we want to retain part of our lives, which are a little bit private, which aren't the business of other people, aren't the legitimate business of other people. So really the issue, the, the, issue, the, the question that should be posed is more along the lines of um, what legitimate right have you got to know all these things about me? Um, interestingly, I, I saw an argument, I was uh, having dinner at an international conference and there was a, a very uh, a very animated argument between uh, a Dutchman and somebody from Belgium about this very issue of curtains in their houses. Uh, because one country insists that every house should have very thick curtains and in the other country the norm is to have your curtains open at all times of the day so people can see in and see what's going on. Yes. yes we, we, we know Anne. It's all Anne. We're all time. Andrew? Uh, it's, it's a very good question. And I think the, yeah. having nothing to hide, it, I think it misunderstands the nature of security and privacy in, in an important way. There are many, many reasons, as William just suggested, for, for having secure forms of privacy. And often there are contradictions in policy around this. So David Cameron announced recently that he wants there to be nowhere where the government can't see. So he wants there to be, you know, he questions whether we should be allowed to have encryption. He wants the government to be able to see into every conversation and so on, if necessary, for you know, the right reasons. But online banking would be impossible without encryption. If the British government want Britain to be the most secure place to do business in the world, but at the same time they want to ban encryption, those are completely contradictory. Um, and you can't make a system which is open to the eyes of the government, but not open to the eyes of, I don't know, um, Chinese hackers. Uh, they are one and the same thing. So encryption is already with us everywhere in everything we do. To start making exceptions of that would, would break encryption. You couldn't have exceptions for the government and then security for, for all the other nefarious people who are trying to get in. So, um, I think we have effectively come to the end of our session, um, and, and I'd like to thank our participants. Uh, it's uh, really interesting to think that people think that uh, curtains aren't there to keep in heat, um, uh, <laughs> or that uh, there's value in the water, which is why I'm going to continue to drink my own spring. Um, uh, and uh, so, I'd like you all to thank our participants in usual fashion.